Everybody wants to be the one to start a new sports league in America. The broad sports history in the United States is something to be admired, and if you're the one to have founded one of the leagues that are still standing today, your name is as good as gold. Plenty of people have tried, and sports leagues have come and gone, but not many have failed quite as hard as this one. This is what you don't know about the World Football League. Welcome to What You Don't Know About Sports, where we delve into the forgotten stories, teams, and athletes of sports history and question widely held takes on today's sports. I am Blake, and this is Matt. Howdy. And today we're going to tell you the story of one of the many failed American sports leagues, but possibly the worstly failed one, if that's a thing. Uh, The World Football League. Uh... Matt, quick question for you. Is there an American sports league alive today who would benefit from a strong, hefty rivalry? Or are we just good with what we have? I think I think the answer is no, right? Like I don't think I don't think there would be a benefit at this point in our history for a for a hefty rival. Like a hefty rival? I don't think so. I mean if you look at the last couple of times where that's happened i think we've talked about that this on the show like um the indy car split uh went from the you know number one form of motorsport in the country to like an afterthought even today 30 years later and then we're going through it right pga tour live golf it makes both sides worse the viewing experience for the fan is worse and i'm sure some good will come out of it we've gotten more events on the pga side where there's Um, better players playing each week. That's cool. Uh, So that's a benefit, but I don't know about a a rival. I think, I think the, the, this idea now that leagues, the big leagues are having more cooperation with like the leagues under them, passing rules through players through kind of mimicking the, the major league baseball, minor league baseball model is better. I think that's where the growth would come, right? XFL, USFL, G League, that kind of stuff, more than a another big shot. Let's take on the big boys kind of rival. I th- I think I agree. I think that I think that uh, the the major sports leagues in America are pretty pretty solid. Like their their base is pretty solid at this point. They're not going anywhere, and so I think that the best thing for a sports league mm-hmm. of the same sport. That who could they the best thing that they could possibly do is become like a developmental league like like the minor leagues are already set right in baseball those are those are solid and that's and that system is weird and by the way not it's not that the pro sports leagues in America I don't believe this and I'm sure you don't there's there's not things that right should right. be changed or could be done better by these leagues of course but uh, but trying to start a rival to like do away with the existing league is not the way to do it. Uh, The G League, I think, is a great opportunity for players who want to play professionally in the United States. It helps some get noticed and end up in the NFL. And uh, as 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 much as the World Football League failed, some people came out of it. Some individuals came out of it in a positive light and made it to the NFL and had successful careers because they played in the WFL first. So. I think that's the best chance for a league like the XFL or the USFL. It gives the guys who can't make an NFL roster today, it gives them a potential avenue for doing that in the future. Right? Trying to trying to beat that league is not going to work. But just trying to exist playing in the off season when that league doesn't play, just getting the getting reps for certain players who may eventually get back up to the 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 I almost called it the major league, but the, the the predominant league in that sport. I think that's the best case scenario. Yeah, if you think about the the benefits, you know, player development. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, when these rival leagues form, you get 
teams and cities that wouldn't have got the team otherwise, right? ABA, NBA merger, AFL, NFL merger, world hockey, NHL, like that kind of thing. You get teams in new markets, um, even American League, National League is that kind of thing in baseball, but older. Uh, that thing, new rules, uh, even, you know, you know, collective bargaining agreement type things come from these mergers, but we've got kind of a healthier way of doing that, right? The XFL is doing the weird kickoff rules and the one, two, three point conversions and a different way of onside kicking. Like they're trying that out on behest of the NFL kind of like it's said without being said, Mm -hmm. you can see if the rule change works before you pass it on. Um, the pitch clock, you know, went through the minor leagues in baseball. So rule changes, markets, we've got testing grounds for those things now. So I think you still get the benefit that you would have gotten from rival leagues duking it out. You still get the same benefit, much healthier, right? You don't have to split fans' opinions. and Because, you know, you know how we are, right? If if your fans, if my team's playing in the NFL and your team's playing in the other league, then not only does your team suck, your entire league sucks and you suck and the city you play in sucks, right? And we gotta we rip <laughs> apart and split the fan base and and you have very few people who then support both leagues. Right. So it it, it you yeah, know yeah. the benefits are here without the the risk, I think. Yeah, I th- I I think I agree also. Well, uh, as I said a minute ago, the World Football League did not come about, or did did not come about, and ultimately fail without some positives. But we've <laughs> got to go through a lot of bads to get there. We'll, we'll we'll talk about some of the goods probably all the way at the end. That's how long it takes to get there. Just hold on. So on October second, nineteen seventy three, the World Football League officially launched via a press conference in Chicago. One of the main driving forces behind its founding was a gentleman named Gary Davidson. He was an attorney and a business from from California. Uh, He had founding interest in both the American Basketball Association and the World Hockey Association, both of which uh, had just enough success that the NBA and the NHL, respectively, decided to merge with them uh, taking some of the teams from those two leagues that he helped found and adopting them as their own in a way. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe that this one failed so badly when that went so well, but we'll get there. Uh, the press conference and basically announced the founding fathers because Davidson knew that he needed investors to start this new sports group, probably because he had done this before. And so this press conference announced a few names that you may or may not recognize, uh, most of them already sports owners and and people around the sports world, but uh, they go as follows. Robert Schmertz. Is that not the coolest name? Schmertz. He was the owner of the Boston Celtics at the time and the New England Whalers of the WHA. That that, uh, team is going to come up multiple times here in the near future. There you go. Howard Baldwin, a former hockey prospect. He was a co-owner of the Whalers. Uh, R. Stephen Arnold. He had a lot going on. He had he was a sports promoter. He was a member of the New York Bar Association. And in various ways, he was involved in the ABA, the World Team Tennis, the International Basketball Association, the World and Hockey would've, Association, would've and the National Women's me. Volleyball League. <laughs> How do you... Oh gosh, <laughs> married to the game. Absolutely, God, he's married to the game. Uh, ben Hatskin, he was the owner of the Winnipeg Jets. You're seeing a, a pretty strong hockey correlation here. Uh, Nick Maletti, he was the, known as the Godfather of Cleveland sports. At one time or another, he had owned interest in the Indians, the Cavaliers, and the WHA's Crusaders. Probably the richest of them all, though. Gentleman by the name of John Bassett. He was a Canadian movie producer. He was a former tennis prodigy in his youth, and his family owned a Canadian Football League franchise, along with two Toronto newspapers and an interest in television stations in Canada, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, the CBC, I think. Uh, So he was by far the wealthiest. Uh, And of course, you want him to be on. Uh, because you need money to start something like this. 
But from the beginning, some of these gentlemen that I just mentioned would be would go on to be owners, some for very short periods of time. And that's because owner issues ran rampant through this league very quickly. The, they could not keep people owning a team for very long. Uh, Davidson, who tried selling the Philadelphia franchise to a local investor, he learned that he actually didn't have the financial resources he claimed to have, and so he couldn't make that sale. After that, uh, one source said that a gentleman by the name of Ken Bogdanov, Bogdanov, he was an unemployed lifeguard, like a 20-something unemployed lifeguard, just showed up one day and wanted to buy this Philadelphia franchise. Uh, the asking price was $600,000. He did not have that. Uh, Davidson said, okay, well, how about a uh, how about a $50,000 down payment? Uh, nope, don't have that either. He said, I could give you twenty five. dollars Nope, sorry, can't can't sell you a can't sell you a WFL franchise for twenty five thousand dollar down payment. So that didn't work out. They did. A, oh. Philly would eventually go on and find a <laughs> would eventually go on and find a, a permanent owner. Um, Hatskin, who became the owner of the Hawaii franchise, the Hawaii Hawaiians, uh, dropped out as an owner very quickly. And he was eventually replaced by two gentlemen, Christopher Hemeter and Sam Battistone, who were both involved in hotel and restaurant development. So they probably just saw it as a another investment opportunity of sorts. Probably my favorite is the franchise that started in Maryland. Um, they they started when they filed Great name. Great when they name. filed their team name. They originally wanted to be called the Washington oh. Capitals. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? The The NHL Capitals had already filed for expansion at this time by that name. Uh, so a contest was held by the public to name the WFL team for the Maryland-Washington area. And they chose the, commanders. That, that, <laughs> this most recent time, yes. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. The people didn't use that one. <laughs> that time in 1973, it was chosen to be the ambassadors. Still better. Which doesn't sound too bad. Still better. Doesn't name. sound yeah. too bad, right? Yes. Yeah. So the team then became the Baltimore Washington Ambassadors, possibly the longest franchise name in the history of American sports. Well, as any football team would want to do, they would want to play in a football stadium. And so the ambassadors wanted to play in RFK stadium, but the Redskins owner said no. <laughs> so the ambassadors had to completely abandon the Maryland, Washington area. They then became the Virginia ambassadors. They then could not find a home anywhere in Virginia. So they had to completely relocate and they would later become the Florida Blazers in Orlando. If at first, if at first you don't succeed, try many times over and then move. Yeah. And keep going, yeah. Um, to, <laughs> I, that, I, I feel as though, knowing what we know today about the Washington football team franchise, this fits right in with that history, doesn't it? Like, I... I this this just works for that area, right? A, a little bit. A little bit it does. Just kind of wayward and lost. And, and I'm sure there were plenty <laughs> of people who loved this idea. Like if they'd have ever played in the the DMV area anywhere, it would have been amazing. It would have, had, it would have been one of the markets that succeeded. But it didn't because Washington can't have nice things, except for that one little bit where the Super Bowls rained from the sky like manna. From heaven, and then they didn't, and they haven't since. <laughs> so the WFL initially planned to start in 1975. Well, news of a players' strike from both the NFL and the CFL during the '74 season sort of gave Davidson and the Board of Governors of the WFL. An accelerated timeline. They thought that they wanted to take advantage of possibly being the only pro football league playing. They wanted to be the only pro football league on television. 
and they wanted to take advantage of the fact that if they had signed players that were coming to the WFL, that if the NFL and CFL did try and play during a player strike, that they would have these the the superior talent uh, because the NFL and the CFL would be signed, would be using uh, who knows who knows who. Uh, kind of like the uh, kind of like the NFL refs thing. Yeah. That's been about ten been years while, ago now, yeah. hasn't it? Uh, what a disaster that was. We know how well that went. And so they accelerated the WFL accelerated their timeline and immediately started planning to play in 1974 instead. I don't know a lot about business. I'm not going to profess to know a lot about business, but I do know a little bit about just life in general. Uh, and I know that when you move fast and you accelerate things, you make mistakes. I I, I just feel like that's a thing. As a general, <laughs> like you always need somebody in the room when you're like, I think we could do this. I, not a year. We could do this in six no. months. We need somebody to be like, no, no. <laughs> Somebody's got to say for no. A reason. Like, no. Let's not do this. <laughs> yeah. Nope. I think uh, this uh, uh, forecasting here, but I'm pretty sure this is this is one of the main reasons <laughs> that uh, they starting too early was ultimately part of the downfall. So in February of 1974, Davidson and the Board of Governors held a series of meetings in Chicago to discuss details of the newly found league. Uh, part of those discussions were figuring out where everybody was going to play. Because uh, numerous teams were still on the move at this point. Uh, there was a franchise in Memphis that ended up had any, having to go to Houston. The Boston and the New York franchises merged to become the New York Stars. Then the Boston franchise, who, which still existed, they still wanted a team there, eventually became the Portland Storm. So Boston didn't even get one. They moved all the way across the country because... They couldn't make it work. So all of that being said, all of the, the accelerated timelines, the team name changes, the location changes, all of this, all of this ridiculousness going on to get this thing started as quickly as possible in an attempt to circumvent the NFL and the CFL, the WFL kicks off in 1974. And it seemed to have some initial success. According to to reporting, on f- during five opening night games, over 188,000 fans attended those five games, which is not bad on average. It was also reported that the Philadelphia Bell, the WFL football team, outdrew the Phillies that night by over 20,000 people. Also not a bad sign. But... While attendance on paper, or at least by reporting, seemed great, uh, the scoring was not. Uh, As as you would expect, uh, they rushed everything, they threw everything together, uh, and and of course the talent in the WFL is not what you would see in the NFL. The scoring was not up to par, so the games probably seemed a little boring, and they only averaged about, all the teams combined only averaged about 138 points per game and i don't think this is like a yeah we're like the 2000 ravens and we're stopping stopping everything that comes up like they were they nothing was just working it just wasn't wasn't pretty football at all yeah that's the one thing for spring football that it all hinges on even this this new like battle between the xfl and usfl to be the top minor league or whatever quarterback play and offensive play matters like because it's just like you know we watch college football early in the year the defense is usually ahead of the offense and the offense has takes time to get figured out and and the same thing here but they rushed everything so it's worse but if you don't have good offense you're not going to keep eyeballs (laughs) you're just not like everybody can talk about how they love a good defensive struggle and they may but they're in the minority when it comes to actually watching them so a a 13 you show up to a, a, a game and it's it's 16 12 every week uh, you're not you're not show you're not going to watch that regularly um no even the nfl at the time was scoring more points than that so <clears throat> yep can't do that right uh so before you we we're gonna i'm gonna hand yeah. this off to you in just a second but before you go i, I have a trivia question it is it's Patrick pretty great Wong. isn't it <laughs> 
<laughs> That'll be forever yeah. the trivia question answer. Okay, so pretty simple one. There's only one answer. Um, I hinted at it a second ago, but uh, the team, the team name, the team name wasn't it wasn't uh, wasn't apparent. So we're gonna I'm gonna say so. What current mm-hmm. NFL team was founded and revived from a WFL team? There is a current NFL team who goes by the same oh, name oh, oh, in the oh, same oh, location yeah, 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 yeah. as yes, a founding yes, yes. WFL right, team. So, who is it? Um. Okay, so there were teams in Birmingham that can't be it. Memphis can't be it. There is no Florida anything. Obviously not New York or the Vagabond Ambassadors. Um, where was it? Where was it? Um, oh my God, I know it and I can't think of it. It's... Is it an, it's a new team, right? It's a new NFL team, new-ish. It's a it's a very new NFL oh, team. Oh, Houston! It's the Houston Texans. They were the Texans. It is the, right? Houston, is that it? It yes. is the Houston Texans. They were the Houston Texans, and they played, I believe, part of the nineteen seventy four season as the Houston Texans. Mm. They very quickly became the Shreveport Steamer, which just makes you want to run out and buy season tickets immediately. Shreveport Steamer. I guess <laughs> they went to New Orleans. Yeah, man. So, <laughs> but that is the only that is the only team that is the only I should say that is the only NFL team mm. whose name was revived. There are actually a couple other examples which I'll tell you about in a little There's while. Some good names here: Cliffhanger, yeah. uh, Cliffhanger. A couple of names that I'll tell you about in a little while who were revived in other sports, not NFL, but in other sports, but. Before we get to that, you have to tell us the amazing story of one of these teams in particular that lasted all of about this, two days. No, not it's this more than is that. one of the teams and names that did not get revived, and for good reason. It wasn't very wasn't a very <laughs> good name to begin with. Uh, but the team I'm going to tell you about is the Detroit Wheels, uh, and I've never quite seen a story quite so tragic and comedic all at the same time. Don't know how to classify it. Uh, but it is it is certainly a thing to behold. The league, as you mentioned, was trying to kind of rush into its first season, which led them to making a pretty big mistake in Detroit in terms of ownership. Obviously, Detroit is an important city in 1974. It was the fifth biggest city at the time. And if you could get a team there with the television eyeballs to boot, that would be a boon for the league, just like New York or any other large market would be. And so interest was reciprocated where it probably shouldn't have been. Once the league was named and announced, uh, the first interest from the city of Detroit came from a businessman, and we'll put that in air quotes, named Bud Huckel. He uh, called up Davidson, the commissioner, and said that the franchise should go to Detroit and he would be a great person to round up investors. Davidson jumped at the idea and promised him the franchise. This was before vetting him and finding out that he had been arrested. <laughs> he had been arrested <laughs> thirty times and had twenty-seven different lawsuits against how? him. You know how frequent you have to do bad things. You okay? So, so common criminals Not- don't get arrested for every single offense that they yeah. commit, right? Like we can we can all agree on that. So, to get arrested yeah. thirty times, how many offenses did you have to commit? Like. The frequency that you are committing those. Yeah. This guy is this guy is a con man. Like the definition of your local con man, this is him. Because it's it's not just like conning (laughs) the old person out of their money because you said you're gonna clean their gutters. It is it was jewelry, it was people, it was laundry mats, it was any business you could think of. He had he had issues writing bad checks. He had issues taking upfront payment for things and then not rendering services and just skipping out of town. He did all of the things 
that you would do if you were a con man, but tended to stay <laughs> in the city of Detroit, which is not, I think, the wisest thing to do in that instance. He had served um, several prison mm. sentences, maxing out at 90 days once. So this is an actual criminal we're talking about that was given a franchise, or, or at least promised a franchise, <laughs> while he was being vetted and gathering his necessary backers to pay the franchise fee, a different group in Detroit, led by a lawyer, Erwin Ziegelman, convinced the commissioner to give the franchise to them. Obviously, a man who had been arrested 30 times, not the best look. And instead of completely cutting ties with Huckel, Davidson told Ziegelman to include him in their group. Now, presumably this would be to prevent a lawsuit on the other side. You promised me the franchise and didn't deliver, but he got a 3% ownership stake in the team and a $35,000 guaranteed job with the Detroit wheels. Once it began by January 7th of 1974, Edward Robinson, another uh, member of the ownership group announced publicly that the WFL would be coming to Detroit and in naming the investors in the group, he named a man named Arnold Y. Aronoff as one of the investors. He was the vice president of a company that uh, manufactured construction equipment in the Detroit area. Also on January 7th, 1974, Arnold Y. Aronoff issued a statement through a publicist that this was not true. <laughs> Which... As much as it perplexed everyone, it perplexed Commissioner Davidson, who sent a letter to the ownership group saying, quote, obviously Arnold is the main strength of your group, and without him, we would not have accepted your group as applicants oh, no. for WFL membership. <laughs> and this has to be something that stems from the fact that it's January and they were trying to play football in July. Like they are trying to get it all together. And so they just took them on their word that this guy was going to be involved in the ownership group. And he's not like to the point by when everything I'm going to tell you is going down in October. He quote, he's quoted as saying, I've never invested one dime in the Detroit wheels. I was just one of several people approached, which is an end quote. You gotta, you gotta imagine that, they they talked to a lot of people because they knew they had to get a lot of money really fast. And I wonder I wonder if it was just a, a mix up of words or miscommunication. But it also could have easily been uh, malicious in a way that's like, oh, I've got this guy's name on a piece of paper like you. you he's worthy and he's notable and he's trustworthy and all. I could I could see they it going definitely either were way. shooting their shot and uh, it, it didn't go well. It didn't go well. All told <laughs> in trying to raise money or at least raise the pledges of money for this team, a ownership group of 33 different people was created. You may think modern ownership groups buying like billion dollar franchises <laughs> are hefty. There are 33 different people, including Marvin Gaye, the mayor of Detroit, the co-founder of Motown Records, like anybody that is anybody seemingly, except Mr. Aronoff, are investing in the Detroit wheels. Notably, <laughs> however, which sometimes we see in, in more modern leagues, no one who owned a sports franchise in Detroit jumped on board not the red wings not the tigers not the lions no one wanted to be involved in this situation who actually had money and the word and the time to invest it the franchise fee of between 500 and 600 thousand dollars depending on the source was quote unquote raised but in bankruptcy documents that came out later um, they owed the league 480000 of that. So only about 20000 was actually raised and paid to the league before oh, they said, yeah, here, go play football, everybody. And that's just the beginning. They launched the team with this same air of hubris all around. They gave all the owners, all 33 of them, and probably like several other just random people in the city of Detroit, 
gold jackets with the team's logo emblazoned on it. Right, had to be gold, right? Because because we're going to be number one. They had a press conference with the mayor because he's one of the part owners, right? He's got a picture of him holding up this giant certificate of ownership, celebrating the fact that the team was coming, and they were. Uh, they promoted a uh, Lewis Lee, who was a former football player in the area, to be the group's leader, the spokesperson, the, the first team president, which also was great because they could say that it was the first multiracial ownership group in sports. 1970s, that's a big deal. They try to market themselves as being the people's team of Detroit. Obviously, the Detroit Lions already existed, but they were building a new stadium, the Silver Dome in Pontiac, Michigan, and we're going to leave the actual city of Detroit. So they said, well, we'll be Detroit's team. Come watch us. We're not going anywhere. We're going to be here forever. But they had a few problems with that position. Number one, the best venue in Detroit was Tiger Stadium where the Lions played, but the Lions had exclusive rights to pro football in the venue. And after they sort of slandered the name of the team, they said, no, you can't play here. Uh, The University of Detroit had a football field at one point, which would have been a great contender for the home of this team, but it had been demolished three years prior to this. They looked into playing at the University of Michigan, which, as most of you know, is not in the city of Detroit at all. But they were turned down by the University of Michigan. At their intro press conference, one of the owners, in his hopefully only 30 seconds of remarks, otherwise that was the longest press conference ever, a former state senator said, quote, We don't want to rule out Eastern, meaning Eastern Michigan, as a playing site for our team, but I think it would be one of our last alternatives. It's a good thing he threw that qualifier in because it turns out to be the only alternative they had. So the people's team of Detroit moved 37 miles away to Ypsilanti, Michigan. And why? (laughs) They didn't have a home and they promoted themselves. They gave themselves a slogan before they knew it was true. Come on, people. Another rule of business is don't count your chickens, right? Nah, they counted them things. They didn't even count their <laughs> eggs, man. They can't, They just said, we got 45 chickens, and they had like six eggs in the basket. I don't know how they thought that was going to work out. But... <laughs> the math ain't mathing, okay? <laughs> oh, man. To add insult to injury on the stadium situation, Eastern Michigan Stadium had no lights. And so the first hefty bill the team had to pay was for lights at Eastern Michigan, close to $400,000 that they actually had the money to pay for. And those lights still remain on Eastern Michigan Stadium to this day. Uh, So good for Eastern Michigan out of this. Yeah, they got something out of that. That was going to be my first question was, are those Mm. lights still there? Is that where they're still playing? So Eastern Michigan got free lights out of it. That's pretty sick. The football side of this situation started more or less just unpromising. There was no fanfare on the football side. They were turned down by several coaches before settling or choosing or turning to Dan Boister of Eastern Michigan. They did not snipe that team's hey, we're gonna play at coach, did they? Uh, can we borrow your coach? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. And the, and the <laughs> WFL played from like July through January. So it's not like he could do both jobs. He, the entire college football season, oh, man. engulfed by the WFL. The, because the team's owners had mostly only pledged money, but had not actually like raised the money, they hadn't given the money to the team's accounts, um, they didn't have any actual capital. So once they did all the fun things, right, paying for press conferences and marketing materials and we got uniforms and we got a logo, we built lights on this. We got it all. Right? We got a coach. We got everything we need. Right, boys? All right, we're out. <laughs> they hadn't thought about the salary thing. They had no capital to pay players. And so they needed to do this on the cheap. Now, they did it in Detroit Wheels fashion during the first WFL draft. They selected players like future Hall of Famer Ed Too Tall Jones 
and several others who would go on to have NFL success. And overall, they picked 33 different players in the WFL draft, and they signed a grand total of three of them. One refusal said that the team was offering, quote, sandlot salaries. And this is a person who would know because he's the guy that ended up becoming an Oakland A. So he actually made good money. Um, But yeah, (laughs) they, they couldn't get anybody to sign for the money they wanted to sign. The situation got so worse, so worse. The situation got so bad that they opened up a tryout. (laughs) <laughs> anybody in the area come show us what you got we need players and 500 plus of the very type of people you would assume would show up to an open tryout showed up now i'm assuming that there were like very good football players that showed up but there were also people who, like one guy who showed up and said i want to play football but i don't know if i can so i'll settle for water boy uh another man brought his wife to try out for the team and she wore her fur coat throughout the tryout because that is the best athletic gear and in the end they signed zero people not even a water boy out of this open tryout they finally finally fielded a team got a full roster averaging about ten thousand dollars per player, which is well below what what anybody in the WFL were making, well below what NFL players were making by a long shot. They were still undercapitalized after they paid for their players and they needed a place to train. One potential training site was covered in manure when they went to go check for it, which should have been a sign for everybody to go home. One of the ownership group (laughs) remarked that they should train on Bell Isle, which is now a nature reserve just outside of Detroit. Uh, The reason he wanted to train there is because the players could be housed in tents. Stick them there. Everything will be fine. We don't need to give them a place to stay. That didn't happen. But throughout the team's existence, housing was a huge problem. One of the team's coaches could never find a place to stay because every time they found out who his employer was, his he went to apply for an apartment, they found out who his employer was, they turned him down. One time he offered double rent plus a double deposit for three months and was still turned down. Like He was going to pay it all up front, double what he was supposed to. They still said, no, sir, we don't want your money here. Uh, several players Jeez. and their families kind of huddled up together in shared homes mm. just in case things went south and they had to move. They wouldn't have to, wouldn't be all out um, a, a full uh, housing allowance um, on the field. This same motif of we're going to be awesome. Everything's going to be great. Look how awesome we are. And then terribleness continued there of the 14 games the wheels played they led in eight of them and in eight of them they lost that lead before losing the game the team could barely rush usually being held way under 100 yards and by way under i mean most often below 70 yards rushing each game and their quarterback was once sacked 11 times in a single game they they're not very good the ugly, the bad stuff, or the comical stuff, depending on how you want to look at it. Their first Ouch. home game only had about 10,000 people attend, in part because the team released two different start times to two different newspapers. <laughs> one, one, one newspaper said the game started at 7.30, <laughs> the other newspaper said the game started at 8.30, and so 10,000 people showed up. The owner was able to reportedly make the owner. One of the owners was reportedly able to make his way through the crowd, shaking hands, talking to people. And the the apocryphal version of the story is that he shook everyone's hand because there weren't that many people there to begin with. By the time their second home game rolled around, people had taken to throwing a Frisbee around the stadium to entertain themselves. (laughs) And the biggest applause of the game was when a fan quote unquote in blue this is how they described him made a one-hand grab in the bleachers and everybody gave him a standing ovation 
That was the biggest moment of the game. <laughs> Frisbee tossing. Players complained of having to bring towels <laughs> from home. One player was unable to get Sad. a shoelace from the team's equipment manager because they had no more. By the middle of the season, the team's airlines and the hotels they were trying to book demanded upfront payment. They had caught wind of what was going on in a couple of flights and a couple of nights that hadn't been paid for. They demanded upfront payment or they would not book them. One of their home games had no programs because they hadn't paid the printer, so he just didn't do it. For practice one day after a game, they had no uniforms because they didn't pay the launderer, so there's nothing there. They went to Philly for a game, and they had no tape. Like The players were showed up, were in the locker room, ready to get ready, and trainer had no tape. They almost had to forfeit the game until a local doctor just donated the supplies, went to his office, brought some tape, said, here you go, fellas, just play on. The ownership amid all of these money woes and a projected loss of over a million dollars over the course of the year mm. pledged, it's my favorite word in this story, an extra $500,000, but then again, never actually gave any of it. And so they continued having a problem. They wanted to put the team in the city of Detroit. And so one of the owners urged fans to write letters to the Detroit Tigers, tell them to ignore the Lions, give us a lease that resulted in five letters being written (laughs) five and it was probably like three of them were by that guy one of the players eventually wrote to the commissioner asking for something to be done it got bad enough Mm. that the players were writing to the commissioner saying give us some Mm -hmm. help some relief do something it all came to an end when several new ownership groups that probably should have been the ownership group in the first place were proposed. First, the owner of Little Caesars Pizza and the Red Wings was rumored to want to buy the franchise to keep it in Detroit and settle it down, but he bagged out when he saw how bad it was. Next, the owner of the DeLorean Motor Company, apparently back from his travels to the future, was interested but also backed out. Upton Bell, who was the NFL commissioner's son, wanted a team desperately but he wanted to move it to Charlotte. That didn't work out because nearly bankrupt, the Detroit Wheels sent their team to New York City to play against the New York Stars in on September 24th of 1974. Midway through the game, the reporters in the press box heard a rumor that the Stars were going to be sold. And the current owner walked into the press box, said, hey guys, there's going to be an announcement made after the game. And the rumor was true, but about that time that he told them that, an AP Wire bulletin came out that said that the Detroit Wheels had declared bankruptcy. I'm going to give you a second to take in the sequence of events there and then tell you again that, yes, the Detroit Wheels declared bankruptcy in the middle of a game. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they wasn't even being played in Detroit. They had sent their team to New York City and then declared bankruptcy in the middle of the game. Um, the reply hmm. to the Stars owner when he said, hey, there's going to be uh, an announcement. Uh, they said, because the rumor was the team was going to move to Charlotte, right? Somebody in the press box, when they said the wheels have declared bankruptcy, they said, frankly, my Charlotte, I don't give a damn. Because... <laughs> <laughs> They're just all having a good time because none of this is making any sense. They played one more game after this in Shreveport against those steamers, but they were labeled in the program as just the wheels. They weren't even the Detroit wheels anymore. They were just looking for anybody to take them. (laughs) And then after that, they became the first WFL team to fold. If you want a true measure of how bad the team was and how bad the situation was, there was a dispersal draft, as you do when teams fold. Everybody got to pick as many teams as you want to, as many players as you wanted to, until you passed. A total of 11 players were selected off the Detroit wheels to go play for anybody else. And Not then good. They were done. Not at all. Not good. Not good. Not good. Really bad. Um, yeah, this would, um, this is, this is hard to rival the, uh, the, the poorness of this whole operation. Like at some point 
why are you only settling for pledges? Like, you need to be writing checks, cash, cash money. Like, we can't, we can't take your pledges anymore. This is, we, we actually have a business to run, and you're just saying you're going to give me stuff. And then you're, you like, whoever just took that and just moved on. Like, that, that's the hardest thing for it's like, no, you got to get, you got to get some money, man. You can't do anything without money. Yes. Like, it's got to be one of those deals where Davidson was sitting there like, yeah, we got a team in Detroit. Everything's going to work out. And then every time he communicated or looked at what they were doing, he had to just be like, oh, <laughs> my God. What are Embarrassing we ourselves. That's what they're doing. 30, 33 people. I always wonder. I wonder. I always wondered how many people are part of these ownership groups that, like, you, you say all the all the time, people I bought a minority stake and blah 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 blah. And it's like, well, how many owners can one team possibly have? Thirty three's got to be a lot. Yeah, that's a, a <laughs> okay. Well, um, and wipe all your tears away. I know everyone is sad to sad to see the wheels go, but they aren't the only ones to go. So save them. Uh, just around the time that the Detroit Wheels uh, went away, so did the Jacksonville Sharks. Both in October 1974, Davidson announced the suspension of both teams, and then they were officially disbanded three days later. And so then the the league was down to ten teams. Well, they expanded right after this. They expanded the the uh, the playoffs, and they then accepted eight of the ten teams. So. Uh, almost all of the teams in the playoffs would have losing records, but that's fun. Um, and going back to the early success that uh, that I claimed the WFL had, uh, it turned out to not be as good as previously thought. It was found out that Philadelphia and Jacksonville both had inflated its inf- uh, its attendance numbers. Uh, the Philadelphia Bell admitted that they had either given tickets away for free or extremely discounted them just to fill the stadium. So for that very first game, paid attendance for the Philadelphia Bell game was only 13,800 and the second game was only 6200. So they had not actually outdrawn the Phillies. They had actually embarrassed themselves and gave away all the tickets. So paid ticket holders were very very low. Other teams were suffering the same issues as the Detroit team and the Jacksonville team were, of course. Portland went without paying their players for six weeks. Mm. Uh, local citizens had to bail the team out because they didn't have any. The team didn't have any money to pay the players. Well, the local citizens were feeding the players and their families because they couldn't afford to eat. Birmingham, Chicago, and Southern California. Yes, Southern California. Sun had a, they had a team. They started failing to make payments, just like the Detroit and Jacksonville franchises. But nonetheless, the World Bowl One did take place. Everyone, okay, it's the only one, by the way. They beat. It's only. I don't. I guess I didn't have to qualify that by saying World Bowl One because there was only one. <laughs> that means that means they beat the XFL like both times, right? And the Alliance mm-hmm. of American but like all the modern leagues, so we've only had one that made it to a title game. So good for them, I guess. Anyway, see, we're we're on a roll. Well, despite all the struggles, on December fifth, nineteen seventy four, the World Bowl, the only World Bowl, was held. It was hosted in Birmingham by the Birmingham Americans, who owed their players and coaches five weeks of back salary at the time of this game. <laughs> The opponent was the Florida Blazers, the uh, the Maryland, Baltimore, Washington, Virginia, Florida Blazers, <laughs> who had who everyone on the team had gone unpaid since September six. They, they had not been paid in three months. Attendance was poor, of course, and the Americans beat out the Blazers twenty two to twenty one. The very next day, authorities arrived. To Birmingham and seized the Americans' uniforms, equipment, and office furniture for lack of payment. Two months later, the Blazers' franchise's items were sold off piecemeal at a courthouse in in Orlando because they had not been paid for. All in all, in in 1974, the WFL 
lost a total of $20 million. Some teams lost more than others. I believe the Hawaii, the Hawaiians lost the most, like three to the tune of two or $3 million alone. And yet they still decided to play in 1975. Numerous teams sort of came back, but they had to do so under different names just to exist. So the Jacksonville Sharks came back as the Express. The Portland Storm came back as the Thunder. The Birmingham Americans came back as the Vulcans. The Chicago Fire came back as the Winds. And the Florida Blazers had to relocate to San Antonio, and they became the Wings. The 1975 season saw only 11 teams, and only two of those 11 teams returned with the same ownership that they had the prior year. It was that bad. Financial difficulties still remained, of course. Uh, in 1975, the, t- the games, for, the, for as long as that season held out, <laughs> uh, the fans, av- fans per game averaged less than 14,000. That's down from just over 21,000 in its inaugural season. The Chicago Winds were shut down after just five games during the 75 season. By late October, four other teams were on the verge of folding. So all the GMs called a meeting, and they held a vote. And six to four, it was decided, you could probably guess the outcome, on October 22nd, just before the start of week 13, the WFL closed its doors. Immediately, 380 or so players and coaches went without jobs. But is being jobless really worse than working and not getting paid as long as they did? No, because and, and there's a stigma, right? You can't quit on your team, and I understand that. But if like like if it was September sixth and and you ain't paid me on September thirteenth, we're having a conversation, and on September twentieth, I'm not showing up. Like like this is I like this is you can't just. Like, for the love of the game is awesome, but n- not when you have to support a family and that's your paycheck. Like, that's no, bad. that's a bunch of people that were, and, and I'm assuming, I'm assuming there were six teams that at least thought that, or four teams that at least thought they could keep carrying on. So maybe there were some teams where these people were actually, you know, making a living and things were working out. So that sucks for them. But for the people who were being mistreated, nah, 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 nah. It's a better, outcome. real bad. Yeah. yeah, I'd rather. I would rather quit the job. I mean, you can go find another job, right? Like, this is this is not your only option. But so through all the bad that that came from about a season and a half of WFL football, there were a few good things. So some coaches and some players from the WFL did eventually make it to the NFL and they led sex successful tenures there. Um, a couple of names that you probably would recognize the last name McVeigh, of course, John McVeigh, who was the grandfather of Sean McVeigh was part of the WFL, made it to the NFL and, and became a successful head coach. Marty Schottenheimer also came out of the WFL. And made made it to the NFL and led a successful successful. I don't know why I cannot say successful Hardwood. career. We already established via America's favorite game show trivia that the Houston Texans of the NFL today came out of the WFL. The Chicago Fire of the WFL would eventually make its way to MLS. And the original game, the original name for uh, or one of the, it's not the original name, the final name of the Memphis WFL franchise. Their name were the Grizzlies before they before they folded. That was reunited in the NBA, of course. And then the Charlotte Hornets uh, also made their way in two different odd yeah. iterations in the NBA that I still don't really understand how that happened. They were eventually revived by those names were revived in those cities by other franchises. So not all bad, but uh, all in all, though, a, a pretty, pretty bad failure, right? Like the, there's not, I mean, yeah, a few players, a few people made it out, but man, this was just a lot of, a lot of wasted time to to end up the way that it did. 
Yes. Um, and, and I think their core ish, because these were people that should have known better. Like, and the ABA is not necessarily the greatest league to ever exist. Neither was the AFL. They both had problems. It's why they merged, right? That they wouldn't have lasted forever. They just lasted, as you said, long enough to, to be taken over and, and some of the, the owners be able to be made whole. This one just did not like, the acceleration had to have made this happen because to to miss on that many ownership groups, right? The second year they probably had the owners they should have had in year one or because they accelerated and it was so bad in year one, they lost some good owners and replaced them with bad. It, it just, it just, it, but it's good that it happened, right? Because when the new XFL started before COVID crushed it, and when the Alliance of American Football for, uh, started before the owner of the Carolina Hurricanes crushed it, um, <laughs> the the idea was like Vince McMahon started the XFL and he said, like, I think it was like a billion dollars he had set aside. And he was just like, yeah, I'm going to lose all of this billion dollars in the first three years. And that's what it's going to cost. And then I'm going to make the money back once it's settled. Like, so there was this idea that I need to have capital. I got to have a bunch of money up front. We got to take two years to plan it out and know where we're going to play and get everything set and then go. So the model kind of exists now in part because of leagues like the WFL. But good, good gracious, did they not do this? Did they not do this like <laughs> a bunch of like college kids just being like, we're going to start a league right now like this? Or like, or, or somebody on a on a mm-hmm. video game just being like, "I'm going to make a custom league. Let's go," and just assuming that it's going to work out. Like it, this, <laughs> just pride is what it was. It looks like a bunch of pride that didn't work. Yeah, yeah. It takes money to make money. Uh, it doesn't you? It doesn't always have to be your money that you start with, but it does take money. Pledges it doesn't. Real. Pledges aren't enough. Especially for the Detroit Wheels. Yeah, pledges aren't real money. You need money. People will loan you money. Yeah. Banks will loan you money. But you gotta have money. <laughs> and that's that ultimately seems to be the issue is they 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 were like the got drunk at a college party one night and was like, Hey, guess what? It's like <laughs> we should do this thing. Be like, yeah. And then it just completely fails because it just does, because the planning wasn't there. But so after that disaster, there are probably plenty of other sports leagues oh, that yeah. would be just as hilarious to talk about. And so we will have to look into some of those. If you know of one specifically, you listeners out there, if you have one that you want us to talk about, please let us know because this is just funny. <laughs> sports leagues failing is just like in hindsight, it's probably bad for the people and the players and stuff at the time, but man. In hindsight, it is hilarious. So let's do it again. Uh, so give us uh, give us all your ideas. Uh, hit us up on social media. Like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And that's what you don't know about the World Football League. Until next time, we'll see you. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of What You Don't Know About Sports. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please leave us a review, five stars only, and hit that subscribe button wherever you listen. If you have a great sports story, we want to hear about it. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WYDKAS Podcast, and on our YouTube channel at What You Don't Know About Sports Podcast. All episodes are written, recorded, and edited by us. Stay tuned for the next episode.